So hello everybody, uh, welcome to today's um, Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Um, as it starts, we'll have a little uh, um, ceremony involved, a gift. Um, so let me start by introducing uh, Dr. Chris Tormey, who is a professor of lab laboratory medicine and uh, transfusion medicine. He's the director of the transfusion medicine and apheresis service and also directs the Transfusion Medicine Fellowship. And I wouldn't be missing an opportunity if I didn't thank Chris today and his whole team of, of how they actually shepherded us through the pandemic in the last um, you know, year with all the transfusion shortages. So thank you to Chris and um, please introduce uh, the Beauvais Lecture. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Dr. Haleen. And uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce the lecture. Usually Dr. Ed Snyder, who really inaugurated the series as the introductor, uh, gives the introductory comments. He couldn't be here today, uh, but it's my pleasure to uh, at least introduce who Dr. Bovey was. I trained a little bit with Dr. Bovey toward the very end of his career, uh, right before he retired from him. Yeah, he really was a, a giant in transfusion medicine and really laid the groundwork for what transfusion medicine apheresis is like here today. He started, literally was the starter of the transfusion medicine and apheresis program here at Yale, uh, and also did lots of pioneering work with regard to aluminization and uh, particularly transfusion transmitted infection and disease. So uh, we are very, very grateful that this tradition continues. And, and thanks so much to Hematology for finding a, a wonderful speaker for us. And I'm very, very pleased. And Dr. Charlie will put this uh, very nice plaque for you to the side here, but uh, very, very pleased for your talk on multiple myeloma today. And thank you so much for coming up here to thank join you. us. Thank you. I'm not allowed to touch right. it, but I well, think it's for safety. Thank you for here. And thank you so much for joining us today. Now, turn it back over to Dr. Haleen. Okay, so it is um, my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Ajay Chari, who is a um, professor of medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And he's really a, a leader in the field, um, bringing novel treatments for multiple myeloma and gammopathy um, to the clinic and um, through numerous uh, phase one um, and two studies, investigator and um, industrial uh, trials. And um, you know, he's the director of the clinical research um, in multiple myeloma program and um, really oversees or has built and oversees a nationally renowned program for both high volume patient accruals and uh, rigorous quality insurance. And um, under his leadership, the program has um, played a pivotal role to um, get novel agents um, to the clinic, really to the benefit um, of the patients. Um, the field in myeloma really has transformed from just chemotherapy to multi-agent uh, regimens um, extending lives for a long time. So Dr. Chari received um, his undergraduate degree um, from Stanford University and his medical degree from the David Geffen School of Medicine at uh, University of California, Los Angeles. He then moved east, completed his residency in internal medicine at Columbia University, uh, went back to California to UCSF uh, for um, fellowship in hematology oncology, and is now again east, but as we hear, heading back to the West Coast to lead the multiple myeloma program at um, University of California, San Francisco, so UCSF. So, well, welcome today. Thank you so much for coming um, to, you know, present your wonderful work. And again, in honor of Dr. Bobby. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> wow. Thank you so much for uh, the kind invitation, the introduction, and this amazing work from Dr. Bove as well. So the title of my talk is Myeloma 2023, So Many Drugs, Yet So Few Cures. These are my disclosures. So when I started off as a fellow, these were the drugs that we had. Um, and I was uh, telling Dr. Weiner that at UCSF, it was almost a diagnostic test of sanity because no one went into hematology. Everybody went into oncology. And we, these were the drugs we had for myeloma, steroids and conventional chemo. And now this is what this table looks like with four new categories of drugs, multiple drugs within each class. And that's just in two decades. And <clears throat> this actually is leaving us with new problems, which is what's the right combination? What's the right sequence? Um, and so I think uh, it's a great position to be in. And in fact, just yesterday I was recording a video for MMRF, which is a nonprofit that's done a lot of work. And you know, I was trying to convey how for a relatively rare cancer, getting this much approved in such a short time is a remarkable phenomenon. And it really requires patients academia, industry, FDA, to all partner together. Um, and it, it's a great paradigm. In particular, the immunologic approach, as you can see, is quite uh, expansive. I always like to mention every monoclonal antibody that exists in human beings is thanks to myeloma, because in the 1980s, a Nobel Prize was given for fusing a myeloma cell to a spleen cell, and that's where the first antibody came. Yet the first myeloma antibody didn't get approved till 2015, so those were naked antibodies. We have an antibody drug conjugate that was taken off, 
because it was accelerated approval. We have bispecifics and CAR Ts. So speaking of cure, you know, we uh, I like this term lymphoma envy. Um, what is the difference between your expected survival and your observed survival? And look at these beautiful flatness of the lymphoma, follicular, DLBCL, Hodgkin's. And also uh, it's worth noting that these cancers are treated differently. Um, they're not, you know, Hodgkin's and DLBCL and follicular each have different treatments, even though they all present with lymph nodes. And we'll come back to that because I think Again, we're in myeloma, we're a little envious about that. So what's myeloma look like? That's, that's the disparity. So I think the goal is to flatten these curves and narrow the gap. How can we do that? So I'll divide my talk into four parts. First is, should we treat earlier? Um, and that's an important question because you saw all those drugs, which are very effective, well-tolerated. Why do we need to wait for patients to get the crab symptoms? Can we not intervene early? And then we can... We have existing agents that we you saw on the table. How do we get more out of them? How do we understand and overcome drug resistance? Then we'll talk a little bit about novel agents and finally future directions with these approaches. So let's start with smoldering myeloma. And uh, this was from Bob Kyle, New England, 2007. You all know MGUS monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance has that linear rate of increase. Uh, whereas the smoldering myeloma actually has three different two different inflection points. So there's this steep rise up. I don't know if you can see my cursor there. No, maybe not. Okay. So you have the steep rise up, then it flattens a little bit, and then you have even more flat. So that the third uh, category is really like MGUS, right? At a certain point, these patients are progressing at a very slow rate. And the question is, how do we pull out those in those first five years, the rapidly progressing patients? Why do we need to wait them for to get hypercalcemia, renal failure, bone disease? Can we not just treat, do we not just treat DLBCLs, for example? We don't wait for those patients to get more problems. And so one of the thoughts was, well, if a patient has about an 80% chance of progression at two years, we should stop calling them smoldering and start treating them. And that was this effort called slim crab. And uh, slim, I am meaning the um, serum light chain ratio greater than 100, and that was 80%. Uh, bone marrow greater than 60% plasma cells, that's 90% at two years. And finally, more than one MRI focal lesion. So I think it makes sense. If you have an 80% chance of progressing in two years, let's treat. Well, um, I think it's not that clear. So let's look at the predictive value uh, in the various studies of these free light chain ratio and bone marrow plasma cells. So um, this table has uh, about six different studies, the Mayo, uh, Greek, Penn, Denmark, this uh, European group, and Mount Sinai. First, I'm gonna call your attention to when these patients were tested. Mayo started in 1970 up to 2010. Uh, and then the others are at least more recent, but this one is also 1980. Uh, these are typically single institution. These are two of these are multi-center and sometimes the inclusion cr criteria are not even specified. So now let's look at the free light chain ratio. What the Mayo does, <clears throat> they bank their specimens for many years and then they go back and analyze that. And that's why they can go back to 1970. The problem with that is radiologic techniques have evolved a lot. And so if you were in 1970 smoldering on the basis of an X-ray, and now you're doing PET scans and MRIs, that's a very different population. So they had 586 patients, which is a sizable number. They did uh, find that the median time, the, the time to progression two years, 72%, which kind of hits, and, and then the Greek study, 98%. So it's these two studies that led to that. But now look at the other ones, Penn, 64%, Danish, 30%, and at Mount Sinai, 44%. Uh, and we had probably one of the largest numbers, 185 patients within five years. So it's a modern data set. And what's also important to note is that the only prospective study on here is the Danish study, which is 30%. So we had just said on the previous slide, if it's 80% at two years, we should be treating. And now look at the heterogeneity on the other studies. What about the bone marrow? That makes sense. If your marrow is packed 60% uh, or higher, you would think this, these patients are going to progress. But remember, if you have 60% plasma cells, but you'd have no anemia, that's how you would be smoldering. Most people, the mechanism of anemia and myeloma is marrow replacement, which causes crowding out of the hematopoietic precursor cells. So these people have to have had pristine preserved hemoglobin, neither drop below 10, nor drop by two from baseline. And yet your marrow is involved at 60%. I would argue that's most likely sampling, right? Because when we do a marrow, it's not a whole body test. The hemoglobin is very reliable and you're testing it time after time. And so the first few studies do show a nearly 100% rate of progression at two years. Ours was 41%. So 
some of the other interesting things here is that <clears throat> the, the numbers of patients are pretty small. So the entire global data set is about 40 patients. And the European data is particularly interesting because in Europe, they don't often do core biopsies, they do aspirates. So if you're saying 60% by aspirate, it's probably 100% by marrow, right? So we know that the aspirate tends to underestimate the core biopsy. So for all these reasons, I personally have not been treating slim crab criteria because I don't feel that there's enough data yet. And <clears throat> the other, <clears throat> excuse me, the other uh, interesting photograph, this is from COVID 2020, right? There was this social distancing warning. And this was a photograph that got a lot of press from Orange County, but the same photograph at the same date and time from an aerial view looked like this. And so, uh, you know, I, I like to say, can't we do better than photographs? Movies are much more dynamic and they tell us what's happening with a patient. So why are we making decisions on patient care on the basis of a single snapshot in time instead of looking at what happens? So we did that. We first looked at the free light chain ratio, greater than 100, less than 100, and we validated what was seen. This was statistically significant. You see a separation, higher ratio. But this is the evolving model, which is if your ratio is different, but it doesn't change very much versus it's rapidly increasing, you can see a much more marked separation. And when we did multivariate analysis, here's all the stuff that comes out. What didn't come out in, um, uh, that was in univariate analysis, multivariate, bone marrow more than 60% did not pan out nor did that free light chain ratio. What did come out was immunoparesis, which means suppression of your uninvolved antibodies, but also the E for evolving, evolving monoclonal protein, evolving hemoglobin, and evolving difference in free light chains. And so the, on the side, you see what that means. The evolving monoclonal protein, on, on average, these patients had a 64% increase in their M spike. They had a decrease of hemoglobin by 1.57, and their free light chain difference increased by about 170%. We specifically pick difference, not ratio, because ratio can be skewed by dramatically by your uninvolved light chain, right? So if your kappa is 1,000 and your lambda is 1, whether the lambda goes to 0.5 or 2 has a dramatic impact on your ratio. And so for that reason, it's the difference that came out. And when you put that together in our Mount Sinai model, you can see a beautiful separation from not reached median time to progression to as low as 13 months. And you can see this 13 months is very reminiscent of that Kyle New England paper patients were almost guaranteed to progress. However, I'm not asking you to go and act on this. This also should be validated with other data sets, but I think we call into question the slim crab criteria. And you could ask, okay, does this matter? Well, this was the JCO paper, and I'll call your attention to all these uh, journals, which are high impact publications. And the JCO paper was randomized, thank you so much, um, randomizing lenalidomide to observation, pretty sizable for myeloma, 100 patients in each arm. And you can see starting at the right, low risk subgroup, no difference in PFS, intermediate risk, no difference. Mm -hmm. And the high risk patients, there was a statistically significant difference, but this is a 25 patient study. There was a 40% discontinuation of lenalidomide for adverse events. And there was also an increase in secondary malignancies. So again, while this is important data, we need to do these studies. I'm not compelled to change my practice on the basis of a 25 patient randomized study. And this also highlights if you do not get the risk stratification correct, your study is going to be grossly underpowered because you started off with 100 patients, but really your question could be boiled down to the high risk subgroup because what are we going to learn by randomizing intermediate and low risk patients to treatment versus no treatment? So the Spanish are doing an even more aggressive therapy. Um, they took carfilzomib lenalidomide index, so called KRD, followed by transplant, followed by consolidation with the same KRD, len maintenance for two years. It, mind you, this is a study that would, they can't even give to their myeloma patients, right? These KRD is very expensive. It's not even approved for myeloma in standard myeloma, let alone smoldering myeloma. But they did the study after a median of 70 months, very high progression-free, very high uh, survival rate. But 48 patients have already had biochemical progression. And two years after stopping all of this maintenance therapy, there's only about a quarter of patients have remained MRD negative. So it doesn't look like using more therapy up front is necessarily curing these patients. And I think it calls into question, you know, what is the goal here? And just, um, I think you're all familiar with lead time bias, right? If you start treating people earlier, they're going to look like they're living longer, but just, just because you're treating them earlier and you really need to have a control arm to understand how much longer they're living. And then there's also this other concept called length time bias. Well, the patients with aggressive disease have a shorter period in which they remain asymptomatic. 
So you tend to have a over uh, proliferate or over representation of more indolent disease in these smoldering categories. So when you put all that together, you're still not even including science. Flow cytometry in one data set also already distinguishes smoldering myeloma who have an MGUS like phenotype in green versus the uh, myeloma like phenotype in red. And you can see a beautiful separation uh, based on uh, pro progress time to progression with the green MGUS like are really flat. So while we are looking to cure myeloma, I would submit that the way we're going to do it is not by treating smoldering, but eliminating smoldering. I think we basically are sitting on MGUS and myeloma. And smoldering is this human-created artifact, which is not histologically determined. It's not genomically determined. It's every year a bunch of uh, political mafia in the myeloma field are basically cutting up the diagnostic criteria to create slim crab and then to 2020. And none of it is based on science. And so I think we really, uh, and I do this every day, but if you're a community doctor treating lots of cancers and you see a JCO Len paper, many patients are getting treated based on that study. And I think that's not right. Uh, we need to do better. So what about using existing drugs? Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Daratumumab-based combinations with dexmethasone, pomalidomide, and carfilzomib, and then also POMDEX cyclophosphamide. Oops, uh, let's see what happened. Okay, so one of the problems in myeloma is that in spite of all of those therapies that I showed you on the table, we have diminishing returns and attrition. So on the left, you have attrition. If you start off with 100% of patients, with each successive line of therapy, we're losing patients. And that goes back to that overall survival curve not being flat. On the right, with each successive line of therapy, we're having diminishing duration of treatment, likely due, due to increased genomic and immunologic complexity. And in particular, the high-risk and frail elderly aren't getting to the nth relapse, right? They're unfortunately crashing and burning through all of our best therapies. And so uh, some people, when we have all of these new drugs getting approved, they want to save the good stuff for later because they say, well, I know that drug X was approved in multidrug refractory myeloma. I don't want to use it early because then what, what am I going to use later? But that's not supported by the data um, because when you save your drugs, you assume that you know who's going to be alive to get it later. And that has not been shown on either side of the Atlantic, actually. So let's look at some ways of approaching relapsed myeloma. Um, this is from one of our fellows who wrote this review paper. And, um, and again, uh, what you're not seeing is the individual uh, titles, but I can tell you these are all New England JCO papers, high impact randomized phase three studies. And there, this first group of studies all has the same backbone of lenalidomide index or RD. And you can um, combine it and, and you can see just RD alone has a progression free survival of anywhere from 15 to 18 months. You might say that's not a big difference, but when you add the experimental arm, you're not seeing that much of more. So some of that difference you can see is you know, 19 months, 21 months. So this is why we shouldn't be comparing the absolute numbers. I think when you have a disease like myeloma where there's more and more choices, the hazard ratios, which are shown at the very top, are much more important because it tells you for a given backbone regimen, how much value add are you getting for your third drug addition? And so the third drugs in the first column is ixazomib, the second was carfilzomib, third is elotuzumab, a monoclonal antibody, and the fourth is daratumumab. And you can see a notable standout with the addition of daratumumab hazard ratio 0.44, which is almost a 60% improvement into likelihood of progression or death. So clear standout, even though it's the same Lendex backbone. So beautiful studies. However, you would pretty much have to throw this slide out for all US patients because of the extensive use of lenalidomide maintenance. There's so much lenalidomide being used in both transplant eligible and ineligible. Almost all US patients are len refractory or intolerant at first relapse. So your Len refractory patient wouldn't have been eligible for any of these studies. So then what do you do with that patient? Well, luckily you have other backbones. You have bortezomib dex backbones. And here, same kind of uh, graph that you're seeing, control arms 7 to 11.4 months in pink, experimental arms 11 to 23 months. And the hazard ratios are typically around 0.5 to 0.6 with notable standout of, again, daratumumab in the middle, 0.31, 70% likelihood in the improvement of progression or death. Um, Something that's also interesting on this study is, um, it, it, I, mean, I don't think this comes up later, but the, this last column is our first example of getting close to lymphoma, right? So we talked about different types of lymphomas are treated differently. This is the first example of personalized medicine in myeloma. The venetoclax, dex, and bortezomib is a triplet versus bortezomib and dex. 
Um, and what's interesting in this is a good reminder of endpoints in clinical trials. So response rate was superior, progression for survival you can see was superior, but actually death was worse with the triplet arm. And so it's a reminder that surrogate endpoints are surrogates for that reason. We cannot look at, stop looking at overall survival. And it turns out that the addition of venetoclax led to more probably infectious deaths, but only in the non-translocation 1114 myeloma. So for the first time, we have a subtype 1114 myeloma where the hazard ratio and progression for your survival was actually even better than daratumumab. It was 0.1. So if you have a translocation 1114 myeloma, none of those patients, I, in my belief, should ever die without having been exposed to venetoclax because of its amazing potency. And this is a unique myeloma. And I think in the future, we'll segment myeloma more like that. Um, but the other reason I'm showing you this data is we talked about on the previous slide, LEN resistance. These studies could allow a LEN resistant patient because the control arm is not lenalidomide containing, it's bortezomib dex. So whether you add in the first column pomalidomide, selenexer in the second, daratumumab, Endeavor is the fourth, and venetoclax, in uh, the red box is the percentage of patients that were LEN refractory. And more important than that, as you can see, even one of our most potent regimens, Dara, bortezomib, and dex, the triplet arms PFS drops in the middle from 16.7 to 7.8 months for LEN refractory disease. So this is a non-cross-resistant regimen, right? So Dara, bortezomib, dex, there's no lenalidomide there, and yet this is having a downstream impact. And so how do we do better? Because I don't think anybody would be happy with a progression for your survival of eight to nine months with relapsed myeloma. And we, this slide does not even reflect the increasing use of CD38 monoclonal antibodies up front um, when patients become DARA resistant. And the other thing I wanted to point out when we look at relapse studies is that um, these beautiful phase three studies are often not gonna allow real world patients to enroll. And we've, we've done some work at, on this, but men, as have many others. And depending on what you look at, uh, the number of patients that are ineligible in registry studies for these randomized studies is anywhere from 25 to almost 75% of patients. So uh, remember that myeloma tends to be a disease of the older uh, patients. So they can have crit kidney disease, cardiac comorbidities, other cancers, blood count issues. So when you put all that together, a lot of these studies that I showed you aren't even applicable to the patient sitting in front of you in clinic. And you could say, okay, so what? Well, the so what is that the patients, as you might guess, who are ineligible for studies have impaired overall survival. So for example, in our data set, we could see that in Lendex, three-year OS was 63% versus 75%, depending on whether they were eligible, and VD 46 versus 61. And those are both statistically significant. So one way to get around the LEN resistance is to try to uh, do better um, combination strategies. And so uh, many of you know about CD38 monoclonal antibody daratumumab, which has pleiotropic effects, in, including complement dependent, dependent cytotoxicity, phagocytosis, direct cross-linking leading to apoptosis, ADCC, and also there's a clonal expansion of T cells when you treat patients with daratumumab. And so pleiotropic activity, preclinically, when you combine dara with other agents. You can see, for example, LEN alone, but LEN plus DARA gives you more lysis, and similarly with bortezomib and the additional combinations. <clears throat> so when Mount Sinai, we were involved in the, uh, I think, a really important study that's, that was done called the Equilis study, where daratumumab was partnered with all of the available agents. Uh, I call it the promiscuous study. DARA sleeps with everybody, and you just keep adding arms to it. And that's actually becoming a new way of doing myeloma studies, because there's so many drugs that you don't really know, of course, you want good preclinical data, but there, you need these kind of basket studies to partner novel agents with all of the approved therapies. And so, you know, two of these studies, I was privileged to be the author on both the Darakarfalzomib dex and Darakarfalzomib dex. I consider them like, you know, the, my kids. And of course, you shouldn't, you can't pick between your kids. They're both important and different. One of the differences is that the median of lines of therapy for DPD was four lines. And the PFS, therefore, was nine months, response rate 71% versus DKD was two lines of therapy, much longer PFS, but it's a different population. And in fact, a pub publication just came out uh, because, of course, the company that makes uh, pomalidomide said this is, looks worse because of the lines of therapy. And they did a study with one line of therapy, and the PFS was 30 months. So it would suggest that you know part of this is lines of therapy. But now I'm going to show you the same slide that I showed you before. We're not going to go through this in detail, but at a high level, on the left, you have all the pomalidomide-containing regimens. On the right, you have the carfilzomib-containing regimens. First is the hazard ratio is pretty much across the board, or 0.6. So 
Uh, they're all adding about a 40% improvement. So not a big difference there, but you also need to look at the absolute numbers because yes, the hazard ratios are your value add, but are you getting a 40% improvement on 10 months or on 16 months? And so you can see with the POM decks, these first few studies, the control arm in pink has a PFS of about four to seven months with the experimental arm gives you about nine to 12 months. And that's what you add cyclophosphamide, elotuzumab, esetuximab, which is the other CD38 monoclonal, or DARA. I was, uh, you, when I was serving as an ASH moderating reviewer, I was, I, this study did not get picked by my colleagues, but I was uh, lobbying for it because of two reasons. One is uh, it was an academic Canadian study, which was actually comparing a quadruplet to a triplet. And we don't have a lot of those. And, and the results were quite impressive. The DARA, Tumimab, Cyclophosphamide, Dex, and POM, 20.7 month PFS versus the control arm, when you do it sequentially, uh, you can catch up, but it's not as good. Um, but what I want to call your attention to is the KD backbone study. So the control arm of carfilzomib dex alone has a PFS of 15 to 19 months, and then the experimental arms do better. And so it looks, and even with the lenalidomide refractory disease, which we said was the unmet need earlier, yes, they do worse with KD, but the control, the experimental arm with DARA, carfilzomib, and dex has an unprecedented 28-month PFS for DKD. So for this reason, I think when you put all the data like this, yes, we should not do direct cross-study comparisons, but I think there are some important principles here that when you have a len resistant patient and the vast majority of pomalidomide studies, you can see are um, 80 to 100% len resistance, uh, you don't get that great a result. And I think there's a role here uh, for class switching to carfilzomib-based backbone. Bortezomib is another option, but it's not as well tolerated and has associated with neuropathy. So over the years, uh, uh, I've been in New York for 18 years now, and of those 13 are at Sinai, I've been privileged to work with a lot of our fellows and house staff on a lot of investigator-initiated studies. Many of them have been, as you can see, the uh, first author um, on the protocol and or the paper. And so uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to just call your attention to one of them, the, and we kind of alluded to this a little bit, the pomalidomide cyclophosphamide dex. So this is our uh, Sinai study here at the right, and there's other uh, folks that have done this study. These are small numbers of patients. Uh, the dose of pomalidomide is the same. The, the cyclophosphamide varied. We decided to give it metronomically. Uh, it's a very cheap and oral drug. So we combined it twice a day with pomalidomide and DEX. And our population was pretty uh, heavily treated, 100% lend refractory. Our response rate was very impressive, 73%. And our PFS is amongst the highest here at 13 months. And the OS also very encouraging. We did see some neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, but relatively low rates of infection. But I think um, this, I routinely use this in clinic, um, even with elderly patients giving a, uh, one additional pill of cyclophosphamide with POMDEX, very well tolerated oral regimen. But we also wanted, and I think one of the privileges of working at academic medical centers is to be able to partner our IITs with translational data. And so um, with my colleague, Samir Parikh at Mount Sinai, we were able to bank specimens and found that at screening, the level of ILOS and MIC correlated with worse outcomes. Uh, so high ILOS, which is a transcription factor that leads to IL-2 expression and T-cell activation, higher ILOS correlated with worse PFS, higher MIC correlated with worse PFS. And also in the lower panels, you can see when you go from screening to progression, those also increased. And in gene expression enrichment, it was MIC that came out as the target that seemed to be the most significant predictor. So maybe not everybody needs a third drug, but if you're giving POM and you have these types of high-risk features, maybe the cyclophosphamide can play a role there. Oops. Okay, <clears throat> now I wanna switch gears to novel agents. Two I'll call your attention to that we've been involved with, Selenexor and tal Talquetamab. And so uh, to set the stage for Selenexor, uh, on the same table, I'm calling your attention to what we call triple class refractory, which are IMIDs, PIs, and immunologic approaches the, in three categories, and pentadrug, which is the five drugs in red, LEN, POM, bortezomib, carfilzomib, and DARA. We know that when patients are heavily tr treated, triple class pentadrug refractory, some studies suggest the overall survival is less than six months. And the other important thing is that the response rate historically for a new drug to get approved in myeloma for accelerated approval, which is how a lot of these drugs that you're seeing on the table got approved, was about 20% and the PFS tended to be about three to four months. So why look at XPO1? XPO1 is a 
a nuclear transporter takes two, more than 200 protein cargos from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. Some reasons to look at it are first in the panel A, you can see that the myeloma patients had higher XPO expression. The other term for XPO is CRM1. Um, so on the Western block, higher XPO expression, higher expression in MGUS and myeloma relative to normal plasma cells, higher XPO expression in patients who are not responsive to bortezomib, higher XPO expression correlated with worth event-free survival and overall survival, and bone disease. So a lot of preclinical rationale to study it. And so this is the uh, pump um, known as the XPO1. And what this pump does is transports three different categories of proteins, tumor suppressor, uh, oncoprotein mRNAs, and the glucocorticoid receptor. Um, you can see an example of tumor suppressor P53 that's well known to everyone. The control versus the treated, you see a lot more P53 retention. Uh, important, MIC, uh, MIC is an example of an oncoprotein mRNA that gets translocated. And of course, the glucocorticoid receptor, keeping in mind a lot of myeloma regimens do use steroids. So when you add solenexer, which is shown in here, uh, in green here, the pump gets blocked and you have the retention of these three categories of protein. So <clears throat> we published in New England the outcomes of the so-called STORM study, which are penta-exposed, triple-class refractory. The eligibility criteria were quite permissive. Creatinine clearance only needed to be 20, neutrophils of 1,000, platelets of 75, and if the patient had heavy marrow replacement, they could even have a platelet of 50. The dosing was 80 with DEX 20 twice weekly, continuously. And that dose came from phase one studies where lower doses without DEX did not seem to translate into response. And so in 122 patients, um, median age of 65, six years or so from diagnosis, over 50% were high risk disease, median of seven lines of therapy over six years. So these are also functionally high risk. And interestingly, from the day that they signed consent to the day that they were dosed, there was a 22% increase in their paraprotein. So these are rapidly progressing patients, not the ones that we're now taking to CAR-T, for example. And you can see they were very refractory to all the backbone drugs. 100% um, were triple class refractory, 96% were refractory to the most potent drug in each class, carfilzomib, pomalidomide, and DARA. And you can see also significant transplant exposure, CAR-Ts. And the response rate in this heavily treated population was 26%. So it hit that kind of 20% cutoff for accelerated approval, including two stringent complete responses. Both patients who had had prior CAR-T responded. Uh, and if you include minimal responses, it was 39 and stabilization of disease, 79%. And median time to response was one month. Median PFS was 3.7 months and median overall survival was eight months. The toxicities can be shown here and they're basically in four categories. There was GI, uh, so grade three and higher nausea was about 10% fatigue, uh, and then sodium and heme. So thrombocytopenia, 53%, neutropenia, 18%. I should mention this drug is uh, first approved in myeloma. Let me just get, grab some water. <clears throat> Excuse me. And also, but it's now approved in lymphomas. Um, and also it's being studied in head and neck cancers and gynecologic malignancy. So this, cast, this pathway seems to have broad importance. Yeah. One of the interesting things about this study is um, you know, how did I end up being the author on this paper? I'm, I'm, I have to say that, and I think I see a lot of trainees here. I wasn't the principal investigator of this study. It was my uh, mentor boss, Dr. Jagannath. So why did this happen? So they came to Jagannath and said, you know, Sinai patients are doing well. What are you guys doing? And he had this blank look on his face. He's like, what are you talking about? Because as director of research, I would meet with the nursing team every week and we went over these things and patients were not doing well. We had those same problems at Mount Sinai, GI, sodium, all of those things. So after seeing this in patient after patient and keeping in mind that at this point, we had no other options for our patients. So we were putting a lot of patients on study. I was like, you know, we got to do better. These patients are suffering. And as we know in oncology and supportive care, supportive care should start from day one, right? So we started adding antiemetics. And so what the company Cariofarm noticed were these numbers, which we didn't have access to at the time because you know we're blinded to it. So our response rate was 54% compared to 26%. Keep in mind, this is a global study of which a quarter of the patients came from Mount Sinai. So 28 out of the 120. Now, the better way to show this data would be the 28 without the 28 patients in the storm, but they didn't give us that data probably for political reasons, as you can imagine, because if we subtracted out the Sinai patients, what could be the response rate globally? But our PFS was 5.3 months. Our overall survival was 15.6 months. So they wanted to know what we were doing differently 
which he didn't answer. And so he said, well, talk to Chari, maybe he knows. So they came to me and I said, well, not me, it's the nursing team. And what we did was we started with the consenting process. We told these patients, look, these are gonna be your adverse events. The good news is the responses occur quickly within a month. As soon as we have those, we can back off on the dose, which correlates with toxicity. And we're gonna start you with very aggressive su uh, supportive care. So we started with triple antimatics on Dancitron, Rolapidin, and Olanzapine. Rolapidin, <clears throat> you may be more familiar with aprepidin. The reason we picked this is that um, aprepidin, these are the NK1 receptor antagonists. Uh, aprepidin has a SIP interaction with steroids. So if, since we're already giving DEX, Salinex also in a way potentiates DEX. And then if you came in there with aprepidin, you were giving whopping doses of steroids. In fact, I learned this because we didn't know this at the beginning, but one patient got floridly psychotic on DEX, the standard DEX with myeloma he'd been always getting. So we learned that lesson. And so this is now a published regimen in clinical lymphoma myeloma. We also used um, end plate um, romiplastin off-label because there's a blood publication that shows that salinexor blocks TPO signaling um, and that leads to decreased megakaryocyte platelet budding. So if you're going to hold a patient's uh, sally for thrombocytopenia, you can give it during the break to accelerate the recovery. So with those, uh, you can see our patients, um, of course, they did come off for progression because we still haven't cured myeloma. But the main thing here that I think led to the better outcomes is that Mount Sinai, only two patients came off for adverse events instead of a, almost a third of patients. And um, I think this is just a good example of, I had no notion that of any of this happening with my career, but we were doing it to help patients and with amazing nursing staff and the nurses, really incredible shout out to them because this they're on the front lines doing all this work and they've been presenting on these supportive care data. So it's a real testament to interdisciplinary care and aggressive supportive care. If you're submitting a paper to New England, they also wanna know that the paper has appeal to more than one subspecialty. I mean, let's be honest, no one really cares about myeloma other than probably myeloma doctors, but I think the general audience cares about XPL1 because this pathway is important in other cancers. And also they want translational data. So luckily our lab again, was able to generate some translational data and they created a three gene signature. So the, what they looked is the Boston study, which I showed you was one of the relapse studies, which was triplet XVD Sonex or bortezomib dex versus the control arm bortezomib dex, looked at differential gene expression <clears throat> and found these three targets that were overexpressed, um, went 10A, DUSP1 and ETV7. Um, we don't know a lot about their functionality, but um, interferon signaling, we know interferon has historically been used in myeloma and there's actually a resurgence of this target with a novel agent coming up. But after finding this, it was validated in um, some external data sets, well, I'll show you on the next slide. So this is the Boston study showing that high expression did better with the triplet than the low expression compared to VD, it didn't make a difference. When you did it with STORM, our Sinai patients that were not treated you, these were also statistically significantly different, favoring the high gene expression, predicting better uh, response. And then uh, the COMPASS data set, which is a negative control, if you will, did not show any difference. So I think this needs to be validated, but when you have a drug with toxicity and a modest response rate, you we want biomarkers, right? Why do we need to give toxic therapies to patients that have a low likelihood response? Conversely, we have many patients that would not be alive today. In fact, I have a patient and this is becoming almost a recurring theme in myeloma. Who I remember in 2018, we talked about hospice. He was able to get onto this study and he had a response to it and had again a response to it later when in compassionate use, he actually spoke at the FDA at an ODAC meeting. And now five years later, he's alive in stringent complete remission and one of his deepest remissions yet because this allowed him to get to a T cell redirection therapy. And so it's a bit of an existential crisis. He, did, he spent his money and did some risky behaviors, but anyway. That's a different kind of problem to have. Moving to another drug that I've been <clears throat> involved with more recently, targeting a really exciting molecule known as GPRC5D. What is GPRC5D? It stands for G-protein coupled receptor, class five member D. You can see on the right, it's a seven transmembrane protein. We again, don't know a lot about the receptor or, or ligand or the signaling here, but what we do know is they don't seem to have shed peptides. And this is important because the other important target that's getting a lot of attention is BCMA, B cell maturation antigen, which does have a sync effect. So it can, it's soluble BCMA can bind um, any uh, compounds that are uh, expressing BCMA. 
So BCMA, uh, so GPRC5D, however, doesn't have that sync effect. It's primarily expressed in plasma cell phenotype cells. And um, you can see this on the bottom panel, MGUS, plasma cell leukemia, myeloma, all have higher expression by mRNA in these two data sets. And also high expression of GPRC uh, in the dotted line was correlated with worse prognosis. So in the monumental one study that just got published last year, uh, we looked at two different, uh, uh, well, this is a phase one dose escalation study. And, you know, it's remarkable that in these phase one dose escalation studies, we're, we're actually talking about efficacy because, you know, historically, we're just saying, what's the right dose? What's the safety? And now, whether it's bispecific or car Gs, we're routinely seeing dramatic efficacy. So in this study, we took your typical advanced myeloma population. The goal was to identify a recommended phase two dose. Um, and initially, we started IV, and then we've switched to subcutaneous. And the two doses we studied were 405 and 800. Um, and they have a step-up period that's done in the hospital to mitigate cytokine release syndrome. And then they get their target dose weekly or every other week. Um, the pre-medications are given primarily in these early doses. And importantly, you know, myeloma patients' least favorite drug, steroids. Uh, if, you, if you ever ask a patient how they're tolerating steroids, they're doing fine. But the, their, help, their caregiver is like, absolutely not. They know when the patient's irritable and uh, not sleeping well. So um, what did we find? In, these were large studies, 143 patients in each arm. This was the updated data actually from ASH 2022, median five lines of therapy. Again, pretty high representation of triple class refractory. And remember, we said that the risk benchmark for new drug approval was about 20%. These drugs are now giving 75% response rates in even more heavily treated patients than we used to have before. The progression for survival used to be three to four months, and now we're looking at eight to 12 months. And the toxicity profile uh, with this drug infections, I'll show you why. Um, of course, we don't want any infections, but having myeloma is part and parcel of the disease in an older population. But the rates of grade three infections are relatively modest at 12 to 17% here. Neutropenia, about less than a third of patients. The number of deaths due to AEs is zero, which is quite impressive. And I'll show you why I'm uh, showing this in, in the future. IVIG support was relatively uncommon. But interestingly, we did get some new toxicities, which, which include um, skin. Uh, so we saw some rashes, typically in the first cycle, some nail changes, some fragility of the nails. And then the biggest thing from a patient quality of life is dysgeusia. Um, so about half the patients have this. Um, most patients were able to modify the dose and schedule to mitigate these. And very few patients are coming off for AEs, but it is something that we're still trying to understand. We presented another data set of patients who had prior CAR T's or bispecific and the response rate of 63%, um, which is again, really encouraging if in, in that post CAR T data set. So again, shout out to our nursing team, interdisciplinary care. The lead author on this is our NP who presented this data at ASH and at Sinai. It's crazy how many patients we put on these studies. I think at this point, we've put 120 patients on uh, talquetamab based studies. And it's again, because we have no other options for these patients. So when you have a high volume center with unmet need, you're able to put a lot of these patients on. So this data looks at 76 patients that got talquetamab. And what we described here was the supportive care that we use. So uh, the skin, um, you can basically use, luckily it's uh, very responsive to emollients and also topical steroids. And rarely if it's a high grade rash, oral steroids are very effective. For the uh, dysgeusia, we uh, primarily had interruptions and in, uh, uh, dose reduction discontinuations. We also used um, oral saliva. Uh, you can see sal saliva substitutes and rinses. But importantly, <clears throat> after all this, only one out of 76 patients has come off study due to a non-progression of disease. So I think that's encouraging data and it speaks to uh, the ability to use this drug. And of course, combination strategies are exciting. Um, uh, <clears throat> Daratumumab has been shown to, uh, as I showed you earlier, expand to clonal T-cell um, uh, population. And so when you combine it with a bispecific that's partly targeting T cells, that there's been preclinical data to show that tal uh, increases daratumumab mediated lysis. So <clears throat> the combination uh, was presented already at ASH, and you can see daratumumab plus tal. Um, the column on the right, the response rate was 80%. And keeping in mind, about half these patients had had prior BCMA targeting therapy. So this is a really tough population. We don't yet have PFS and DOR, but stay tuned for this year's ASCO. Um, the data will be presented. The PFS is 
going to be very exciting, I think. Um, and no change in toxicities, which is reassuring to see. And preclinically, what's interesting is that on the panel, you can see when you start with DARA, the way the drug the combination was done, DARA was given before talquetamab. Um, and you can see initially there's a drop with CD38, CD8 positive T cells. But then after giving talquetamab, those go back up. And uh, even though the, uh, it's probably not a significant change, but there's still a re release with talquetamab of interferon and other cytokines reflecting T cell activation. Um, so it's nice to see that the translational data supporting what we're seeing clinically, that um, you're seeing activity with the combination. So um, the very busy space is really BCMA by specifics. And um, I feel like this is the statins of myeloma. Um, how many do we need? It's probably good to have a lot just to drive down the price. I think it'll be great for patients and the market to have options, but this is probably the most competitive space in myeloma, um, the BCMA by specifics. And you can see on this table are six different companies that are trying to do that. One is already commercially available. The first one in Ticlistimab uh, just got approved in November. I'm not sure if you guys have done any yet here. Yeah, so you've done commercial tech here as well. Um, the response rate with this agent, again, really impressive and heavily treated patient across the board. These are, again, all phase one studies, and yet we're showing efficacy on multiple studies of 60 to 70%. Progression-free survival is 11.3 months. Duration of response, 18 months. But the main concern with this drug is the infections. You can see at the most recent follow-up of 14 months, the one that has the most follow-up in the first column, 76% rate of infections, and of those, 45% are high-grade infections. And there's actually been quite a few deaths. I'll show you this on the next slide as well. So I just looked at teclistimab, and this isn't unique to teclistimab, it's just the one with the most mature data. I think all the BCMA bispecific have the same phenotype. But I took different presentations and uh, updated from ASH 2020, 2021, and 2022, with more follow-up, what happens? So as there's been more follow-up, there's been more COVID deaths. The rates of all grade infections has gone from six to 45%, and the rates of all grade infections, 27 to 76%. What's concerning here is we're not even seeing a plateau. Typically in myeloma, we keep giving drugs to progression because it tends to relapse, but then we're not getting a plateau in the infections, which means that you know this risk benefit trade-off really needs to be thought about. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, of course, these drugs have been accrued in the era of COVID, but talquetamab, the study I showed you, was also accrued during COVID, and we did not see the same COVID-related deaths, and we didn't see these high rates of infections. Yes, you have those other AEs, but no one's dying from them, and you can hold the drug and skip it and recover from that. And in fact, at our, my colleague again, Dr. Preek's lab, uh, we looked at COVID antibody production in various different colors, and you can see that in general, most people had good COVID antibody productions with the exception of two categories. The dark blue is anti-CD38 containing therapies. So you can see in that um, second panel, second column, they had low antibodies and, and the red is even lower, which is the BCMA targeting by specifics. So this probably explains why we're seeing all those COVID related deaths. When you give BCMA directed by specifics, you basically completely abrogate the ability of the body to produce antibody responses. And you leave these patients very vulnerable to all kinds of infections. To give you an idea of the kind of infections I've seen with BCMA by specific, one of my patients uh, went to the hospital with shortness of breath, and not only did he have an pneumonia, he had an empyema that required a chest tube, which I can't remember the last time I've had to put in a chest tube in a patient. Another patient went to a local hospital, and this is the other danger. People don't realize how sick these patients can get. This patient went to the ER with fatigue, was a little bit having some chest discomfort, and was had low voltage on EKG, turned out he had pericardial tamponade, which required emergent drainage. And the cause of the tamponade was a Neisseria subspecies that was infecting that pericardial fluid. Again, crazy kinds of infections that we've never seen before. And it's, you know, we saw from the Venita Clack study, when you have single arm studies and you cannot appreciate the harm coming from them, you will get burned in the phase three studies because these deaths, especially when you think about global practice patterns, if some of these patients are being enrolled in clinical trials where they don't have access to IVIG, to modern antimicrobials, there goes your OS endpoint with these experimental agents. So it's a, it's a real, I think, pause for us in myeloma. So in the last time, a few minutes, uh, I want to just talk about future directions, what I call connecting the silos. So 
despite all those classes of drugs, we have not had plateaus in any of these myeloma subgroups. Um, and why is that? I think the unmet needs, or the other way of saying is who's pulling down those median overall survival. In oncology, we always have to keep in mind patient disease and treatment factors, but there's frail elderly are part of one of the groups that are pulling it down, persistent renal failure, extramedullary myeloma, which has learned to escape the nurturing environment of marrow, the high-risk molecular disease patients, and the multi-drug refractory patients. These are the patients who are pulling down those overall survival cur curves. And I was actually privileged to be involved during the peak. And I, I think we've all been in this pandemic together. And, and in New York, we were in the epicenter. Um, and again, shout out to the nurses that were really the frontline heroes, I think, in the hospitals. Um, but what we pulled together, a global this was a global effort to look at COVID outcomes. We looked at about 300 patients that were uh, hospitalized but recovered versus about 200 patients who died. Um, and you can see uh, some of the important features is median age is 69. Interestingly, they were relatively recently diagnosed. You can see about a, a third of the patients were recently diagnosed. About half the patients were in their first line of therapy, which is again, could, that could be also because these patients may be coming into the hospital more often, perhaps. Um, and then also about half the patients were newly diagnosed. But what I want to call your attention to is the multivariate analysis, which showed, as with most data sets, age was a risk factor for worse outcomes from COVID and renal failure, active myeloma, but also high risk myeloma. This was independent and multivariate analysis. So I was always struck with this, you know, why is myeloma genomics affecting COVID outcomes? And I think this, and this is what I'm getting at is the, the silos that we think about, because we've been talking about myeloma, but one of the first, I think, really important papers talking about cure was this Barlogi paper in 2014 blood. They did gene expression profiling of the whole bone marrow, not just the myeloma plasma cells. So they looked at both the malignant and the normal, hemat normal hematopoietic compartment as well. And what you can see is that there's a marked difference in the 37 gene score from the various categories. And in fact, the CR marrows in green, uh, the dark green, look much closer to the normal bone marrow than all those other myeloma. And this is in the non-myeloma compartment. And on the right, you can see that the patients with myeloma whose marrow, normal bone marrow looked like a donor person, so-called normalization, uh, had a better outcome. So yes, we need to get rid of the myeloma, but we also need to focus on the microenvironment and normalizing that microenvironment. Even in the current era of CAR-Ts and bispecifics, um, in, in the interest of time, I didn't have time to go through CAR-Ts, but there's two commercial CAR-Ts, Siltacel and Idocel, whose response rates are incredible, 98%, 73%, progression-free survival at 18 months, 66%, nine months for Ida cell. And what we are seeing in these and teclistimab is the unmet needs are ISS3 and extramedullary. So siltacel is probably the easiest to see because the response rate was 100% in all patients, but in the ISS3 patients, the median PFS has already reached 34 months compared to not reach for the rest of the group. Extramedullary also reached at 46 months. Still, 46 months is fantastic, but it's not reached for the rest of the cohort. So these are the unmet needs in the era of T cell redirection. And you know, one thing I'll just throw out there is beta-2M actually inhibits HLA uh, expression and the ability to activate T cells. There's actually a CRISPR CAR-T that's being studied now that actually took out this beta-2M and will be, it, it just entered uh, clinical trials. First patient was Mount Sinai. So well, how might we get cure in the future? Probably, I mean, this is one proposal we submitted because um, Janssen was soliciting cure proposal. So maybe quadruplet induction followed by apheresis for both stem cells and CAR-T uh, because your T cells have not been beaten up yet by years of therapy. So doing that, but then, uh, but also debulking the patients because when you, we've known that if you go to bispecifics and CAR-Ts with bulky disease, you get more CRS, more HLH, more problems. So debulk, collect both for CAR-T and, uh, CAR and uh, transplant, consolidate with the CAR-T, and then maybe stop therapy if somebody is in persistent remission and then only do risk adaptive therapy if they relapse and save transplant, which patients don't like as much for true relapse if they don't have sustained negativity. So, you know, if, if we've, I think part of it is we need to do a better job of risk stratifying. You can see from first ISS to the most recent, it's called revised two ISS that was just published in JCO. Um, when you incorporate, and what this does is includes the ISS, LDH, FISH, and also chromosome one amplification. You can see that blue line at the top is pretty close to flat. 
And so we are getting there for some patients. And for these patients, I think we need to probably think about stopping therapy and not doing continuous therapy for everybody forever. But the other extreme is these orange line. And I think this is the problem with myeloma. Neither genomically nor histopathologically can people tell us who's going to be in this 34 months versus not reached. So we're treating everybody the same cookbook fashion, but there's this tremendous heterogeneity. And so we need to look at the immune marrow microenvironment, the extramedullary disease, the persistent renal failure, the frailty indices, also what we call functional risk, which is people who aren't predicted to have problems, but they relapse early, uh, biomarker resistance. And so I'd, I'd love to start moving in myeloma from going to prognostic to predictive, because that's the problem. Who likes telling patients that they're high risk when you're not going to do anything differently, right? Let's start prognosticating, but joining it with therapeutic changes. And I think the way we're going to do that, one clue, again, you saw that with COVID was that even infectious outcomes may depend on the genomic risk of the patient. So I think we're going to need to integrate biology, the microenvironment, also use sophisticated machine learning type of tools, because this is not going to be solved by simple, you know, uh, smoldering myeloma 2 2020 <laughs> modeling. We need databases. Um, and I think with this iterative integration, uh, we can try to flatten these curves and maybe, uh, you know, discontinue some patients' therapies because we are curing 10% of patients already. And just want to thank the entire team at Mount Sinai and my future team at UCSF. And thank you all for your attention. So I think as a myeloid person, we're incredibly envious of the myeloma <laughs> um, armamentarium. So are there any questions in the audience? Um, I know our myeloma team is in clinic and I don't know. Well, I figure out the Zoom. Um, so what do we know about both biologic differences and outcome differences by race and ethnicity? So <clears throat> great question. Um, African-Americans tend to have a higher incidence of precursor and myeloma. Some studies suggest um, they may have better outcomes if, if they get access to care. And some studies have shown disparate outcomes, but when you go to de data sets like the VA where the care is equalized, that disparity has gone to the point where even potentially they may have more favorable outcomes. But I think the big problem, as we know, is the underrepresentation. As we were talking earlier at Sinai, we've actually been really happy that our enrollment to clinical trials is 20% African-American, which matches the clinic, and 15% Spanish speaking, which also matches the clinic. So I think we need to make sure that these therapies are being advanced uh, and I know you guys are doing a lot of efforts for community outreach and diversity as well. So hopefully we can continue tackling this. But uh, the, and also I should add, Compass did a detailed ge uh, genomic profiling of different race races and did not see dramatic differences. Awesome. So I'm I'm always interested in new technologies and molecular. So you know, are you going to introduce single cell RNA sequencing? You know, like. Whole, whole genome sequencing, et cetera, into the clinic up front? And then are you going to use, for example, um, you know, the vice specifics early kind of? Yeah, um, um, it, it's a great question. The, uh, you know, it's, uh, myeloma is interesting because it's really a blend. You're a myeloid person, but myeloma is a blend of a solid and liquid tumor. And I bring that up because there's a lot of efforts trying to using MRD in myeloma. But I would say CLL and the acute leukemias are much more advanced because you can do blood or marrow and you're done. And in myeloma, it's so misleading um, because we have spatial heterogeneity and genomic heterogeneity, right? So if you do paired samples of an extramedullary site and a marrow site, you can get very disparate results. And we've had multiple patients who'll have RAS and BRAF mutations at an extramedullary site, but not in the marrow. So you need where you're doing your sampling matters. And then there's also the issue of within a patient, you have these different clones. So I think we have a lot more work to do in myeloma. And part of it is getting tissue because, uh, and we're, you know, I'm a big believer. We, I've never used interventional radiology so much uh, as I have in the last five years because we need these targeted biopsies um, because you see in bispecifics and CAR-Ts, those are the patients who are not responding. And those the, that's the way that a lot of patients are relapsing. Mm -hmm. So if we don't get these specimens, we're not going to understand it. And there's some work showing that not only is the problem the genomic complexity at these sites, but also the immune microenvironment is more permissive in these extramedullary sites. So 
Um, it's a real uh, work, but single cell, I think is part of the story, but I don't think it's gonna be the complete answer because you need to do a lot more uh, sampling. Oh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk, Dr. Chari. One thing I'm curious of your opinion on, as you kind of mentioned, as we intensify treatment, we talk about cure or discontinuation of treatment. I know MRD testing, as you touched upon right before, um, is kind of help guiding and that's kind of becoming a surrogate endpoint. I've also heard like from mentors and in clinic, like some myeloma patients getting a reversal back to that MGUS state. So as we push really deep MRD negative responses, and then we are also talking about how do we better balance intensity of treatment and give people treatment breaks. Like where, how can we distinguish like that cohort that we can have a, a M spike present and be okay with it? It's a great question. Um, I actually, my, my, even though I'm not starting at UCSF till August 1st, I'm taking a three month uh, jobby moon or fun employment it's called. So highly encouraged because when in physicians do you get to do that? But in my first new um, interview with our potential candidate at UCSF, a, a potential faculty member, junior faculty gave a talk and, and she brought up a lot about MRD. And so my question to her was kind of like along the lines of, uh, and I think the backdrop to it was there was a recent FDA IMS meeting um, to advance uh, biomarkers, drug development. And one of the questions is uh, the use of MRD. And I actually agree with the regulatory bodies, both FDA and EMA, that right now it's not ready for prime time. And it's because we have not, as an academic community, done a good job. Because um, it. so when you're doing MRD testing, uh, first problem is you're not testing all patients. You're only testing people that are suspected CR. So that's going to inflate the sensitivity and specificity of the test because there are going to be people who will be MRD negative but have pet avid disease or have an M spike. So if you're not testing every single patient, that's problem number one. Then you're not testing them at the same time point. So that's problem number two. They're not always getting imaging. Then the quality of the aspirate. So this is another difference between myeloid and myeloma. So the aspirates can grossly underestimate. So if you have a hemodilute aspirate, that could throw you off. Then if you're doing 10 to the minus fifth versus minus six, that's going to throw you off. And then also persistence is important. So what if you're MRD negative at one time point and in six months, it's you either did a better aspirate or it's back. So when you put all that together, I would be loathed as a regulatory body to accept it as an endpoint right now. We need to do a better job. And I think the starting point is to do blood-based assays first, right? So Right now, I think luckily, because we are a protein-based disorder, mass spec or mass fix, depending on what you call it, that's an easier endpoint. Do it on everybody all the time, right? And if that's negative, then you can go to the marrow because if you're, if you're positive in the blood, why do you even need the marrow, right? And then similarly, there's work being done on peripheral blood MRD um, next-gen sequencing as well. So I think, personally, I think that's going to hit first before we accept marrow-based MRD as an endpoint. Okay, I think we could be here another hour because it's just so fascinating, but we're past the time. So thank you everybody for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're lucky to get you up from New York City, but we'll fly you across the country uh, to hear more after. Thank, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Great to meet you.